So as soon as the uh, projector comes on, uh, the next talk will be by uh, Kevin Milliken, who has apparently mastered the mysteries of the light system. And uh, take it away as soon as you feel like it. Um, I was a I was a student of Dan's between off and on between 1997 and 2000. One of the really exciting things I got to work with Dan on when I was here is um, I was one of the first instructors who taught the second edition of Essentials of Programming Language as, as it was being written. So we would take the drafts of the book right off the printer to our class. Um, sometimes they didn't appreciate that. It was, that was a lot of fun. Um, I'm really glad I got that opportunity. I left. Uh, Indiana in 2000 and went to work for this small research and development company near Minneapolis um, doing something that they call software obfuscation. So they got put on this project to try to figure out how to, how to do this. Um, so what is obfuscation? Uh, <laughs> this, is a, this is an entry from the International Obfuscated C Code Contest. It's a uh, Lisp interpreter written in C. Make some nice use of preprocessor macros, and they've even got the, pre the pretty shape going on. Um, this is some obfuscated Haskell from the, the International Obfuscated Haskell Code Contest. This uh -huh. takes two pages. It's a lambda calculus interpreter. He, he used really, really long identifier names. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's, that's software obfuscation. We want to try to do that on purpose and automatically. The idea is that this, is that this might uh, hinder reverse engineering of the software. Um, when I came to the field, I was a little surprised to discover that it was lacking any notion of what an obfuscation really was. So all, all of the notions of obfuscation were informal. They were either based heavily on intuition, uh, it sure seems like this is going to work, or they were empirical, um, where you had to implement it and then you had to form expensive red teams to attack the software and gather data about how easy it was to break and that's a very um, expensive operation, and, and um, it's quite a bit of science that goes into proper red teaming. So we wanted to come up with a way of, of characterizing what is, it, what is it that makes program transformation and obfuscation. So the first insight is that it doesn't really make sense to talk of an obfuscating transformation as an absolute. It's relative to a particular analysis that you want to thwart. In other words, what may be a, an obfuscation for for a particular analysis may have no effect on the results of some other analysis. So we need to make this relative to an analysis. And my colleague, Mr. Dahlman, kept insisting on this until finally I believed that, yeah, that's, that's really the only way that makes any sense. Um, my other colleague, Mr. Nehas, um, was, was very deeply worried about the, the problem of how to compare. So he, so he latched onto the idea that an obfuscating transformation was one that worsens the results of an analysis. And so he wanted to come up with a way to compare the results of an analysis. And you'll see that the, there's quite a, there's quite a uh, rich body of theory for, for uh, um, program analysis. The problem was that um, any of the orderings that we knew on analysis results didn't work for what we wanted to say. And, and the real problem there is that um, we have a, a state in the original unobfuscated program that may correspond to multiple states in the obfuscated program. We needed some way to connect those. Um, so first we need to start by characterizing program transformations. That's something that um, this audience shouldn't have any problem with. Um, if, for those of you that like commuting diagrams, there's your, there's your first commuting diagram. <coughs> we're, um, we're considering source to source transformations. We can, we can modify this framework to, to handle other sorts of transformations. It simplifies things. We don't have to have different versions of things floating around. Uh, this is our example of a transformation. So this is my running example for the talk. On the, on the left hand side we see the original program which evaluates E0 and then 1 of E2 or E3 and then or e, E1 or E2 and then E3 in, in either case. We transform it to this new program that behaves the same um, provided that um, e, E1, E2 and E0 don't have any weird continuation capture control effect. Um, so if this is, a, we're actually doing this on C code so it's, it's, it's more safe for what we're doing. Um, it's more obscure. It's more obscure. <laughs> So the question, the, question, the question is, the question I'll try to answer is, is this an obfuscation? 
And so first of all, I said that it was, had to be an obfuscation with respect to some analysis. So it doesn't really make sense for me to ask, is this an obfuscation? Is this an obfuscation with respect to some analysis I have in mind? The analysis I have in mind is computing the control flow graph, the intra procedural control flow graph of that little hunk of code. Um, so we model an analysis as a function from programs to some abstract domain, which is a lattice. Uh, there's your second commuting diagram there, showing the results of analyzing the original program and the transform program. Um, here's the example. We're computing the control flow graph. Uh, I show on the left the code. On the right, you see the um, a schematic of the control flow graph. So I'm, I'm assuming that E0, E1, E2, and E3 are all basic blocks. And I'm, and I'm kind of alighting details of entry nodes and exit nodes and things like that. Um, below that, you see the actual results computed by the analysis, which is a set of edges. Over, over some set of nodes. And that, so that's the uh, control flow graph. Um, so we said that the results of the analysis was uh, an abstract domain, which is a lattice. So we have a partial order from that lattice. It's not the right one that we want to use to compare these transformations. Um, the, the analysis results in the original program and the analysis results on the transform program live in such vastly different parts of that lattice that they're not comparable in any interesting way for us. Um, the ordering we want to use on this control flow graph lattice is uh, subset. The ordering we would use when we compute the analysis is a subset ordering. And um, neither of the results of, of the analysis of either of these programs is a subset of the other. Uh, on the top, you see the original program. On the, on the bottom, you see the transformed program. And it has, has more edges, so it can't be a subset of the, of the first program. And then you see that the E0, E1 edge is missing, so that can't be a, so neither one of those is a subset of the other. So they're incomparable in the lattice of analysis results. Um, this is where abstract interpretation comes to the rescue. I was exposed to abstract interpretation when I came here as a, as a um, wide-eyed person who'd never heard of Scheme and, and met Dan and thought this was one of the, one of the coolest things ever. Um, what we want to do is we want to connect the results of the analysis to the semantics of the source language. And we do that in abstract interpretation via Galois connections. A Galois connection is a, a pair of of lattices and a pair of functions between them, the functions uh, alpha and gamma. Alpha is mnemonic for abstraction. Gamma is mnemonic for concretization. So the abstraction function maps the concrete s domain of the semantics to our abstract domain of our analysis. And gamma ma maps backwards. They're, they're, they have to be monotone. And then these, these, two, uh, these two characteristics are the, are the defining characteristics of a Galois connection. If you um, abstract a, a, a value in the concrete semantic domain and then concretize it back to the concrete semantic domain, you get something which is um, greater than or equal to what you started with. So that, that's, that's worse or the same. If you uh, concretize an abstract value and then, abs and then abstract it back to the abstract domain, you get something which is less than or equal to what you started with. Um, on the bottom is a little alternative formulation for the category theory aficionados of of Gallup connections. It's really just an adjunction between categories that are that are partial orders. So the so abstract interpretation uses alpha and gamma to connect the results of an analysis to the semantics. In fact, they use it to often derive the analysis implementation from the semantics and the implementation of alpha. So so from the implementation of the semantics, if I have an implementable semantics, which which is Dan has taught me I to, to always carry with me. And um, and alpha, we can induce an analysis. Gamma tells us how to interpret the results of the analysis. So what we get out is this control flow graph. And gamma tells us how to view that as something in the original semantics of the program. So here's the example again. Our, that was our original program. The semantics of the program gives us a set of execution traces. So we have in mind a collecting semantics that collects sets of execution traces. And I've elided a whole bunch of details about those states. There's two execution traces. There's two possible paths through the program. Abstracting that gives us a set of edges where we have states that are adjacent and any execution trace become the edges. And then and th that's, that, that's that control flow graph that I had before. Concretizing that gives us um, back the set of all the paths through that graph that start with an entry node and then with an exit node. And then this little commuting diagram indicates the situation we, we, we have now. So, we, so S maps the program to its semantics and alpha abstracts that. A was the analysis and the analysis is is um, the alpha, uh, alpha of S of P is the, is the best correct analysis. In practice, the analysis is worse than that because it has to make some approximations or some trade-offs beyond what alpha makes. Um, gamma 
tells us how to interpret the analysis results in terms of the semantics of the programming language. And the, the properties of Galois connections are that alpha followed by gamma gives us something worse than what we started with. Um, this is the second program. Um, something really interesting goes on with the second program. So the, the, the program's up there. The semantics of the program is a pair of execution traces. There are two paths through that program, one corresponding to when E0 was true and one corresponding to when E0 is false. Um, the abstraction of the semantics is this guy. It's just a description of that graph, as a set of, a set of edges. Um, concretizing this graph gives us all the paths through this graph which includes two bogus execution traces that didn't occur in the, that couldn't ha have occurred in the original program. One corresponds to the case where um, T is true the first time I evaluate it and false the second time I evaluate it. And the other one corresponds to the case where it's false the first time and true the second time. Um, so we get these two bogus execution traces. So that suggests now that we want to try to, now we've got the idea that there's extra information being added by this transformation. Um, this is a little bit of math. Um, if a function is completely multiplicative, which means it commutes with the greatest lower bounds, um, this, is, this is a property like, like continuity from, from domain theory, um, then we know that there exists a Galois connection, that it's part of a Galois connection. Um, so, uh, um, so that's going to turn out to be useful for us. And um, another really nice thing is that alpha is completely determined by gamma. So now we've got, we're back to this comparison problem. We can use gamma to map the analysis results back to the concrete semantic domain, and, that, and that, that's how we're really interpreting those analysis results. Um, they're still not directly comparable. So the semantic, the concrete semantic domain is also a lattice, has a partial order relation. Um, this, is, this is not a useful, it, it, again, the partial order relation on sets of execution traces is a subset ordering, and neither of these is a subset of the other. So we're not there yet. Um, this is where I got stuck. What, and, this, and then this is that observation of Mr. Nahas that the states in this program, the original program, do not, do not correspond in, in any useful way to the states in this transform program. And I was just mentioning that over the telephone to Dan, that this is kind of a problem that I'm really searching on. And, and he's pointed me towards a Popol 2002 paper by the Crusoes, which I had already read when it came out, but I didn't understand the, re the real impact of it. So Dan pointed me towards that paper. I took a look at it and um, found, found what I needed there. We need a correspondence between the states in the um, original program and the transform program. Uh, the Cousseaus give us that. The, um, any program transformer in the program syntax induce, introduces a corresponding semantic transformer. Um, they induce the semantic transformer by observing that there's actually a Galois connection between syntax and semantics, um, which, is a, which is a really interesting sort of throwaway remark in a little one paragraph section. Um, the, the semantics of a program is a concretization of the syntax, or in other words, the, the syntax of a program is an abstraction of its semantics. Um, so we, so we, can use, we can use this nice property of Galois connections to define what um, D is. D is a decompilation map. It takes a set of execution traces, turns it into a program. Um, something, is, something kind of interesting goes on there, and, and maybe a little disturbing, is we have this greatest lower bound. Which is, a, which is a disjunction. So if you imagine that I had a, a, a set of execution traces that contained two execution traces that were completely, had completely different states, what program does that correspond to? It doesn't correspond to any program in my source language. What it corresponds to is a non-deterministic choice right at the start of the program between, between one of these two things. So we actually have to ex extend our source language to include a non-deterministic choice operator so that we can map in the, in the backward direction. And a, a troubling thing about D is that it's often not computable. Um, so now we have all the now we have all the pieces of what we want for this defini definition of obfuscation. We can compute a semantic transform which maps the states in the in the original program to its transform. This is this T sub S, and so we can follow all these arrows to get to here. And if that is less than that in the order relation on the semantics then we have what we call an obfuscating transformation. Um, the slide that's missing is the one that shows what happens. Um, here, um, we have the concretization of the um, semantics, of the analysis of the transform program. We have the um, 
concretization of the original program, and if we apply that semantic transform to it, what we really do is we really follow um, this arrow backwards, which is that D map that gives us the original program. We transform the original program, gives me my transform program, and S gives me back the control flow graph that had only, or it gives me back the set of execution traces that had only the first two. So in that case, and, and so the ordering on my concrete semantic domain is a subset ordering. In that case, um, that really is an obfuscating transformation according to this definition. In other words, um, analy analyzing the program, or I'm sorry, transforming the program and then analyzing it and then interpreting those results gives me something worse than if I had analyzed the original program, interpreted the results and then transformed them. Um, we have some more commuting squares, we can, do some, we can do some simplification. This last line is, so, so given a transform T, if we can, if we can compute the um, associated semantic transform, or if we can just, just describe it, then we, and we can prove that it has this property, then we would call that an obfuscating transformation. So what's left to do? Um, we really just hit upon this after after I talked to Dan and then we worked out all the ramifications, we've, cons we've really kind of scratched the surface of, of transformations that people normally consider obfuscating transformations to, to um, what we've found is that most of them are obfuscating transformations if you pick the right analysis. So everything that somebody conceives of as an obfuscating transformation is an obfuscating transformation, but what they're not explicit about is with respect to which analysis. Um, the Clouseaus tell us in another nice little throwaway paragraph that there's also a Galois connection between the untransformed and, and transformed program semantics. And this is um, this actually is um, sort of echoes work that Julia and Amr did earlier. Um, two separate pieces of work. Um, so the question is, can we use that to compare transforms? What this gives us is a is a way to decide if it, or, or a definition to help us decide if a transformation is an obfuscating transformation. If I have a pair of those things, is one better than the other, or are they incomparable? And can we use this framework? the way that abstract interpretation is used to design obfuscating transformations given an analysis. Um, so how is it inspired by Dan or related to Dan? Well, as I said, Dan introduced me to the idea of Gallup connections. Another thing I was really interested in while I was here was um, staging the CPS transformation so that it would be easier to teach to undergraduate students. And that's something, something Dan really encouraged me um, in. And so he pointed me towards uh, this first paper here, and it turns out that that actually contains uh, the germ of the idea that there is this Galois connection between transformed and untransformed programs. Um, Amr and Phil Wadler expanded upon that in an ICFP paper. Um, and then, of course, Dan had the, had the bright idea that this is really where I needed to look to find, to find what I needed for this. That's it. Um, people do. So um, one reason you might not do it is you want to run it in stock hardware, and you don't want to have some trusted software base that. So you just put it in between you and the Yeah, yeah. Pe people, people do. I mean, that's a, that's a better. I mean, I my earlier slide says this hinders reverse engineering. It doesn't. It doesn't give you anything like the guarantees of cryptography does. This this guarantee of cryptography does. Is it plausible to use what you just did to write an unobfuscating device? Yes. Because it knows all the obfuscating transformations you would want to discover. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think I'm going to do it. <laughs> I want my code to be clear. And I want to unobfuscate something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've written a lot of obscure code that I'd like to fix. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, no, that's, that's interesting, though. Just, just, just like an analysis, um, there's sort of a there's sort of a theoretical best obfuscation, and often that's not something that you can actually compute very well. So you have to make some approximation. Yeah. <laughs> so I, have a, I have a question. Yeah. I don't know if this is an obfuscator or not, or just something to have around. But if you have a lambda calculus expression and you feed it to the abstraction device, you end up with SKs and I's. Mm -hmm. And then you take that lovely program with SKs and I's and you replace them all with the appropriate X's. 
Mm -hmm. Your entire program is now parentheses and x. Mm -hmm. Would you call that an obfuscation? Yes, with respect to the right analysis. Yes. What would be your analysis? <laughs> um, it's just two, you only have two characters. Now you need two three characters. Left parentheses, right parentheses, right parentheses, right parentheses. Right. Um, and a blank. And a blank. And a blank. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, I'm sure that would be an obfuscation with respect to the right class of analyses. Any other questions? Okay, thanks very much.